Hi, everyone. Thank you, Tom. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Roland Roberts. Welcome to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio. This is our pre-show, our three-minute pre-show here. We're going to be going live in just a few minutes to a whole lot more people. Uh, but I always enjoy talking to our live stream audience first. And, uh, and you can be watching live at CourageousRadio.com. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out there. Uh, I love seeing the different comments. And during commercials, of course, we, uh, we chat back and forth. So uh, feel free to reach out. Also, if you want to call, I know that uh, last week we had several callers and people just loved the kind of reality entrepreneurship side of this. So if, uh, if you have any questions or you're thinking about starting a business or you've got a little business and you, know, you may be doing a hundred bucks in revenue, you may be doing a million dollars in revenue, but whatever it is, uh, give us a call. We'll talk about it. Or if you're just uh, a young person trying to start one, uh, start a business, then you know this is a great show to, uh, to reach out to and and of course, it's all free of charge. They're not going to, uh, you know, hit you up for for a uh, hundred dollars or a thousand dollars whenever you call. So, uh, very good. Thanks, Tom. So we're going live here shortly. By the way, if you have a topic that you want me to hit on, put that in there as well. And and if you've got commentary, if you've got ideas that you hear from other people uh, or past callers. Feel free to call and chat about those and, you know, tell me the pros, the cons. Uh, tell me what you've done before that didn't work and uh, or, or what uh, what you think someone should do. That's always a lot of fun. It, it really is. This is your show. It's a show for entrepreneurs. And uh, and of course, we can brainstorm together. And, and I just I love helping entrepreneurs. This is the one time a week that I'm able to give and serve at this level and this magnitude and this number of people. And so uh, it's my it's my honor. I'm I'm humbled to be able to do that. And uh, it's your chance. You, there's never a reason. There's never an excuse not to do it. Uh, you do not have an excuse. You don't have a reason uh, for why you're not getting started because you're one phone call away. Welcome to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio with America's CEO and host, Dr. Roland Roberts, where he takes your calls live to help you start businesses, turns companies around, and goes to the mat in boardroom battles. Entrepreneurs, this show is for you. Dealing with the stress of payroll, struggling with time management, losing it balancing family and work, wondering how to get more customers. You are about to get your questions answered. Bringing to you now, America's CEO and former CEO of the Hoverboard Company, here's Dr. Roland Roberts. Welcome to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Roland Roberts, and I'm taking your calls, your questions, opinions on all things entrepreneurship every Thursday at noon Eastern Time, 407-916-5400. Call me at 407-916-5400. Tell me about your product, your service, your business, or just chat about uh, previous callers or uh, previous ideas that you've heard. Love to hear what's going on. You can also send me questions at CourageousRadio.com. Send me some questions, CourageousRadio.com. You can watch live uh, anytime on Facebook at Courageous Media. Just search for us at Courageous Media. Uh, You can watch the show live by going to CourageousRadio.com. We have a lot of fun, too. We talk to you, interact with you in between the commercials. Certainly, uh, also, as people reach out to us on social media, or through our live streams with questions and comments. During the commercials, we're able to respond to some of those things that we're not able to on air. So it's a lot of fun. Also, if you are ever in the Orlando, Florida area and want to be a part of our uh, a studio audience, in-studio audience, then uh, just send us a message at CourageousRadio.com with the date, and we'll make sure that, uh, that you're added and welcome. All right, now it's time for my take on this week's top business news. It's been a busy week. GE, General Electric, you know, the light bulb. Okay, so they are urgently selling off assets uh, to pay for debt. They are in big trouble. They are in hot water. 
and uh, and they are selling off assets like like no one's business. In fact, uh, investors are quite worried about the future and the stability of, of General Electric and GE. Kellogg, this is interesting for all you cereal lovers and all these kids at heart and people who like me, were raised in, you know, and bred on, on cereal. Uh, Kellogg is looking actually for buyers of its cookie and fruit snack divisions. Uh, so Famous Amos, if you like Famous Amos cookies, if you like Keebler, you know, these, um, uh, these cookies, uh, these brands are for sale. And, uh, and, and this is really what Kellogg needs to do because they have lost focus. And whenever profits and revenues start to decline, you got to go back to your core business, your core competencies, and, uh, and, and do what they do best, which is cereal. Uh, by the way, that's the opposite of what GE is doing. The opposite. But uh, it's a smart move on Kellogg's uh, part. Amazon announced this week their second headquarter location. Very interesting because uh, Amazon really put a lot of hype into this. I mean, even I remember a day or two before they made the announcement, the Wall Street Journal and some of the other uh, publications, business publications, literally tracked Jeff Bezos' uh, private jet travel. Uh, so like what places, uh, had he visited the most and it, and it ranked them uh, to try to get some idea, any idea of where this second headquarters is going to go. You have to understand wherever they chose tens of thousands of jobs come in, uh, well-paying jobs for the most part. And, and, and so what they ended up doing was choosing Arlington, Virginia. So it's, it's interesting that they are in two cities that have major talent pools and uh, they will have access to some of the the, the best and brightest minds in, in the country, at least in terms of a uh, high concentration of uh, massive brain power and think tanks. So it's not a very smart move on their part. Also, he's highly political. He's a highly political figure. And so it does not uh, surprise me at all that uh, being in the, you know, the heart of D.C. is where he would want to have a, a presence. Uh, also, where he'll be spending a whole lot of time and certainly with whatever future ambitions he has. So uh, also, ironically enough, uh, a lot of developments on the U.S.-China trade war this week. Uh, you know, prior to a week ago, I wasn't really, uh, I, I was I was monitoring it, but I wasn't deep into it. I certainly did not expect to be, you know, advising Beijing or, uh, or anyone else or the State Department or anybody else on my thoughts on the U.S.-China trade war. However, a lot of things have changed in the past week, and so I've gotten up to speed, um, to a level and a depth that I never thought I would. Uh, but, you know, I, I've lived it on the other end. So it's not so much that I, I go in on the uh, the end of knowing all of the policy and, and, and what should happen on both sides. How I uh, approach the U.S.-China trade war, I mean, you got to understand, this is the largest, you know, if you want to call it trade war in human history uh, at this time that we know of. And Hundreds tariffs on hundreds of millions of dollars worth of products have already been slapped on both sides. And there's only about $500 million left of products to slap tariffs on. Not a whole lot, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, it, with as bad as it is. But there's been a couple of interesting outcomes already. First of all, China's imports from the United States are down 25 to 30%. And the U.S.'s imports from China are up 5 to 10%. So, so get this. We put tariffs on them so that they will increase uh, or, or so that they will you know, have more fair and equal trade. But then what ends up happening is American companies forecasting the tariffs are stockpiling and adding more things. So even though they're more expensive, they're they're you know, loading up. And then the Chinese, because they are, uh, they are controlled by the state, uh, or, you know, the nation of China, uh, they don't need a whole lot of alarm bells and warning signals to, hey, back off from buying from the United States. Only buy what you absolutely must and be trying to find it elsewhere because they want to feel the pain and it supports, you know, China's position and their bargaining uh, with the United States. So, that's what's happening right now. But, you know, it's not, but see, our president, the president of the United States is, cannot and does not have the authority to contact Walmart or Nike or Home Depot or, you know, anyone else and say, you are no longer allowed to buy or import from this country or you need to slash it by 50%. I mean, because we are a free enterprise, we're free markets. So it's a very different scenario and uh, than, than, than China's dealing with. So even though it's, 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 
it was designed to hurt China and it it has increased the, the, the current imports from China. That also means, by the way, that with an excessive uh, inventory, stockpile of inventory in the United States, at some point in 2019, it will slow down, okay? It will slow down. But for right now, it actually had a reverse impact. It increased the amount of imports as opposed to decrease, but they have decreased the amount of imports. So anyway, I'll be sharing some of those thoughts, and then I will also be talking about how that affects you and I as, as just entrepreneurs. I believe in ethical entrepreneurship. I believe in promoting global ethical entrepreneurship around the world, and uh, I think of free people, I think freedom of thought, we should not be intimidated by it or scared by it. I think we can be encouraged by it. Uh, but, you know, any kind of establishments are usually uh, feel threatened by free thought. I mean, religious institutions, um, uh, large companies. That's why the entrepreneurs don't don't live inside of those halls because they are in government, because that threatens power. It threatens, uh, you know, the, the fiefdoms that, that have been built. And so... Anyway, that's going to be an interesting time, and I'm speaking next week four times in Tiananmen Square in Beijing at the Great Hall of the People. That's China's Congress, November 23rd to the 25th for the Chinese Association of Small and Medium Enterprises. Then I'll be going over to Shanghai a week and a half later and keynoting Bloomberg's event uh, there uh, with the CEO of Sam Samsung and, and some others, and so that's going to be a great time. Uh, you can learn more about my, the events that I'm speaking at or hosting at CourageousGlobal.com. Also, I've got room for a couple sponsors if you're looking to get your product uh, into China or a presence there. It's a whole lot cheaper than uh, opening an office and J JVs and all these other things there. Uh, it can be done uh, extremely cost-effective. And so if that's you, reach out to us at office at CourageousExperience.com. Uh, I'm also uh, putting, putting 30,000 people in a stadium in Nairobi, Kenya on May 10th. And uh, that's going to be pretty fun. It's all about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. And we've got so many people uh, that are coming. And, and, you know, I encouraged families to come and bring your kids because uh, we're really wanting to, to expand, uh, you know, young people's minds and give them hope and belief and inspiration and, and, and learn how to generate income for yourself and not relying on a job and and, and, and the skills that they will learn make them better people, better husbands, better spouses, better wives, better better children, uh, more responsible, more disciplined, uh, more controlled. They, they're able to control their mind, will, and emotions a whole lot better whenever you go through entrepreneurship. I've got some callers on the line. I'll be taking you as soon as we get back from this short commercial break. You're listening to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio with Dr. Roland Roberts. I'll be right back after a word from my sponsors. All right. Hope you're enjoying it. Great show. And uh, we've got George uh, from Florida on the line. And uh, so, George, we'll be getting to you here as soon as I get back. And if you have any other questions, uh, make sure that you uh, you reach out. I see uh, I see some people online. Yes. Yep. That's uh, my former assistant right there. She was amazing. Lives up in the Northwest, the great Northwest. And uh Good to, good to see you, Jamie. Good to see you. Glad you're doing well. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to hopefully save a few lives, a few businesses today. And uh, people call with questions. I'm telling you, one call can be the difference between you losing a million dollars or making a hundred million dollars. One call. One call. One call. The, the business you don't start may be the one that costs you the most money. You know, they say, they say nine out of ten businesses fail. That's why I started ten. You, what you call failure is what the rest of us call learning. It's called school. And uh, and, it, it, and everybody learns different lessons because it's the lessons they need to learn. It's what they don't already know. It's uh, Maybe it's emotional maturity. Maybe it's waiting. You know one of the most difficult things as an entrepreneur is knowing when to wait and when to go. Because sometimes you're supposed to just be aggressive, ambitious, and just go hard and punch through and do what you got to do to make it happen. And other times, that'll put you in the port. I mean, that, that's absolutely the wrong response. You need to back off. You need to be still. And that's the hardest thing for entrepreneurs. You know, no one ever asked me, hey, how do I be still? What they all say is, tell me what to do. You tell me what to do, I'll do it. You tell me to stand in the corner upside down on my head uh, for three minutes and I'm going to make a million dollars, I'll do it. You tell me what to do, I'll do it. And I'm telling you, that's not how success works. The hardest thing is knowing, uh, and the biggest mistakes people make is they go when they should be waiting 
and they and they wait when they should be going. Uh, it's sometimes it's exactly opposite. It's exactly the opposite. So we're going to be back in one minute. So we're going to get everything replugged back in, and uh, we're going live uh, with uh, George and Tommy. Welcome back to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Roland Roberts. I'm taking your calls live every Thursday at noon Eastern, 407-916-5400. If you're thinking about starting a business, want to grow your business, just want to talk business, give me a call, 407-916-5400. But at this time, I have a couple calls on the line. I want to go ahead and get them in. George, welcome to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio. Wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, so what's the question? What's the topic here? All right. First of all, I want to thank you for having me here. Actually, I'm Kenyan Nairobi, uh, from Nairobi, so I'm glad to see you in Tent Mate. Wonderful. Welcome. All right. So my, my question is all about equity, and uh, I'm going to divide it in three parts. First of all, I want to know how do you value your company? Um, do you base it on potential, future potential, uh, or the current potential that it is at? And my second will be, how do you divide um, equity in terms of negotiations? And third will be, how do you manage equity after having investors? Do you pay them on a monthly or a quarterly uh, rate? Okay, great questions. Uh, I'm going to take them one by one here. I think I've got them all. First of all, valuation. Valuation is, I, I was just talking uh, with a public company about this yesterday. Uh, valuations are very interesting because uh, there, there's a few methods that are recognized. Uh, and then, uh, but even then I can get five or 10 different experts and I'm telling you, they don't agree on the valuation. Uh, I, in fact, one company had, uh, three professional valuations done that cost $150,000 each. Okay. Stay with me. $150,000 to get the valuation of a company because the, 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 the company was for sale. And, and I forget, I think it was like 17 or $18 million. So the lender was obviously going through this. They required the upfront payment, 150 grand. They came back and they, they, they valued the company a whole lot less, uh, significantly less because of chargebacks, addbacks, uh, things that they put back in saying, well, that, w that doesn't exist once the company is sold and you know, things like that. So valuation is very tricky. I can tell you there's a few basic ways to value a company, okay? Um, I, I know that depending on the industry, and it also depends if you're an individual buyer or a private equity buyer and what size your company is. So if you're buying a small business, like if you go on Craigslist and you're looking for businesses for sale, all right, or, uh, or, or one of the businessforsale.com or whatever, you're sometimes, depending on the industry, they'll go one-time sales. Uh, me personally, if I was going to buy a small business, I'm going to look at the net profit, the, the, the net, and, and I want the owner, I don't want the owner to put back his salary. I want, because, because you got to get paid. So uh, I want to see what the net profit is. Uh, and it gives me an idea of what I'm going to have for working capital, what I'm going to have for, for salary and payment and what I'm going to, you know, what I have to work with. So, um, in that case, if you go off of net profit, which is what I would recommend, because revenue doesn't tell you anything. If you've got $10 million in sales and you, you net 300 grand, that's a, that's, that's a very low margin, right? So, um, okay. uh, it's, I'd rather, I'd rather it do $2 million and net 700,000. See, so the, the, the net profit is what I personally go off of. And then you got to look at, uh, and then there's probably a multiple of that. Uh, and, and then, and, but sometimes not a lot of small businesses are for sale for just the amount of the net profit. So 300,000 net profit, they're going to sell it for 300 grand. Look at the assets. A lot of times uh, what you're actually buying uh, is, is important when you're valuating a business where most people go wrong is, you know, buy the, the seller always like in everything, real estate, cars, you know, uh, liabilities, anything, they value it higher and, and the, and the buyers value it lower, but yeah. you have to understand 
that a lot of times people place value, too much blue sky value. And what I mean by blue sky value is they put a lot of uh, emphasis on what the brand is worth or what they, how great they think their logo is or, uh, you know, uh, the upside potential. And I got this yeah. contract and, and we can do all this business and this is what it's going to be. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so when I value it, I, you got to do a little bit of both, but I would probably say more 80, 20, 80% is what is because you're buying what is not what could be. Um, well, if you right. were buying what, 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 if what could be already was the price would be a lot mm -hmm. higher, <laughs> but you'd still be mm -hmm. buying what yeah. is, and even it could still go higher. So I don't ever buy what ifs. I don't okay. ever buy upside. Uh, mm. upside is what I get for taking the risk of buying your company in the first place, because usually yeah. you, you, you kind of wonder why people would do it. So you're valuing the business. Uh, I would focus on net profit and then whatever a fair multiple is of, of that, as opposed to, uh, or in, in, in assets. I mean, like I said, depending on if this is a technology company or an asset heavy company or, or what it is. The second thing, how to divide equity. Um, yes. uh, I, I th that depends on how much money you're trying to raise. Um, but, but here's it to me, the simple formula is you've already established a valuation, um, yes. and you already have a certain amount of equity, a certain amount of shares, whether it's LLC or, or incorporated. So you already know if you've got a million shares and the company is worth a million dollars, uh, you know, it's a yes. dollar a share. So if somebody puts in a hundred thousand, they just got 10% of the business. Uh, yes. so you, you can divide equity based on that, but what gets tricky is, okay, once you take that, there's what they call post equity valuation. So as soon as you get $100,000 from an investor, your company is no longer worth a million bucks. It's, it might be worth 1.5 because of what you're able to do with that 100,000, putting in marketing, putting in assets or whatever else that grows the company. So, so the valuation goes up. There's a pre-cash infusion valuation, a post-cash, uh, post-infusion valuation. Uh, but any money that you take past that does get mm -hmm. a little bit cheaper because the valuation is higher. So you don't have to give them as much equity uh, for the same amount of money. Okay. So, right. so, so think through that as you, as you divide the equity, take the equity, it will change. It's not a formula that you'll be able to use all the way through. And then the third thing you talk about is dividends. Um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, that I would, would, would focus on paying out an investor dividend and equity dividend right out of the gate. If they're investing in a startup, uh, if this is a startup or as opposed to an existing business, then, then, then you're not going to be paying dividends out. They, they just want the cash flow to keep going back into building the business. Um, okay. But uh, also, you the, the 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 exit strategy is critical. Uh, so depending on what your you know what your your legal structure is, they have to have a way out. And it may be uh, starting at month twelve, you know, uh, or the thirteenth month after a year. Uh, you, we're going to pay back X percent of sales or X percent dividend until you've recouped this plus X percent mm -hmm. or, or pay interest only, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a dividend based on percentage of sales and percentage of profit, actually not percentage of sales, percentage of profit. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and I would, do, I would not do that at all the first year because they're wanting you to win. You know, they're not wanting to bleed you to death. Uh, if they're investors like that equity investors, uh, they're already taking a risk. They know what the risk is. And, uh, but you do need to work out the payback uh, strategy. There are, uh, you know, one of the folks on our uh, website at Courageous Radio buys companies. Uh, and that's been one of the great exit strategies for, uh, you know, for small businesses and for investors in a business. Uh, so that's possible. They are able to get their money out in six months, uh, whereas you may not be able to start paying them back for two or three years uh, based on whatever the business does. So anyway, those are some of the highlights. Any, any follow-up questions real quick? We're going to commercial in 30 seconds. All right. So the other one would be, how do you pay? How, how, what, what is like the time frame? Do you, do you do a quarter, every quarter, uh, or is it like every month? How do you pay your investors? Uh, typically, you would do a quarterly return. Typically, you do quarterly. Uh, you know, monthly makes uh, cash flow is everything in a startup business and a small business. And I'm telling you, monthly is going to hurt. Uh, quarterly is going to hurt too because it's a bigger number. But uh, that's why it's so important to get friendly investors. Not all investors are created equal. Thanks again for calling in, George. You're listening to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio with Dr. Roland Roberts. I'll be right back with the business hot list hit list after this. Awesome. Well, that was fun. And uh, I'll be uh, taking a caller here as soon as we get back. And uh, I think that's going to be, be be fun, man. I love when people call in; it's so much fun. I hope you're enjoying it. That was some uh, some deep questions, actually, on valuation, uh, company valuation. I mean, that those are things that you're normally in a boardroom for two or three hours discussing and talking about. And um, 
you know, we were able to talk about it there in a few minutes. And, and, and but, but he was succinct. He knew exactly what he wanted to know. Uh, valuation, uh, potential, you know, upside, basically, I call it blue sky, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not real value. Um, it's potential value. It may be something. It may not be anything. But I can tell you this, 99 times out of 100, whenever I pay for blue sky, it's not there. It's not there. Uh, you can even tell me that the brand is worth X, Y, Z. And maybe it is because you've got 1-800 plumber and, you know, that's just so well known and all these other things. But if I'm better at what I do, if I am better at the marketing, better at the strategy, better at getting out there, doing the work with more excellence, being on time and, and, and hustling, I can beat 1-800 plumber. You know, so how if you're going to overcharge me or overvalue me for that, um, you hung your, you know, your hat on that one thing. And that's kind of been your holy grail. But, you know, the right person can go and totally beat that. So anyway, great questions. The, the dividing the equity, I'm telling you, I would not be paying dividends. I, I don't, uh, unless you're a large public company, um, you know, or a very profitable small business, uh, you're not going to be paying dividends for a while. So if it's a startup, that's not even happening. To promise your investors, that just makes you look silly. You hear that? It makes you look silly. Makes you look like you don't know what you're doing and an unseasoned entrepreneur, which should make them pause and hesitate to even loan you the money. Eh, loan you the money. Invest in your company. Third segment. One minute, we're back in one. Welcome back to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Roland Roberts. I'm taking your calls live every Thursday at noon, 407-916-5400. I've got Tommy on the line. Tommy, welcome to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio. Hi, how are you? Great. Um, I have a question regarding network marketing. I was recently approached by a friend who I've seen be pretty successful um, to, to join her doTERRA business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I see often friends on Facebook and all over social media and um, doing really successful and making a lot of money and doing well. And then on the other side of that paradigm, I see people who are failing and not making money. And so I just wanted to get your general thoughts on network marketing and whether or not you thought it was something that you should genuinely invest in and take on as a life venture and really neglect those other ideas that could end up being more profitable and safe in the long run. Yeah, that is an amazing question, actually, because, uh, wow, network marketing. Uh, so, you know, I'm getting ready to attack uh, like 70 million Americans have purchased from a direct sales company in the last uh, within the last 12 months. Uh, there are currently uh, 10 million active direct sellers in the United States. So uh, it's going to be uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big deal. It's quite a faith, but it's, it's common. It's, it's, it is. It's common. It's to religion, and I joke. Yes. You know what's ironic about it? So here's my take. Number one. The, the, it's kind of like gambling. The way to make money uh, gambling is to own the casino. The way to make money in network marketing is to own the network marketing company. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, here's the thing. The people who promote the lifestyle in network marketing, and, you know, I've, I was a CEO of a direct selling company. I turned one around. Uh, I was on the uh, advisory uh, education committee for the direct selling association uh, years ago. So I, I, I've been there, but uh, and, and I've lived it. I've experienced it. I, I know it from the distributor side. I know it from the, the executive side. And what I can tell you is, yes, it's true. You know, whatever it is, 1%. There's usually in, in companies that are uh, $10 million or more, there's always, uh, one, you know, one, two, three big, big income earners. 
uh, and then there's everybody else. You know, it's the it, and, and they say, well, that's the way society is. Ninety seven percent of people are dead broke, and three percent, you know, the haves and have nots. It's it, mm-hmm. so they're saying, hey, this is no different than anything else. And you know, if nine out of ten businesses fail, well, nine out of ten of our network marketing businesses are going to fail. I think part of it too is the mindset. Like you know, we were talking about they, they sell it as a business. But technically, they're an independent contractor. I mean, you're, you're like an Uber driver. You know, you, you, you don't own Uber. You're not the company. You get a paycheck from the company. So you're like a glorified employee. You are an independent contractor. The only thing different is you're, you can do it on your schedule, which means you can make as much as you want. You can make as little as you want. The other difference is just similar to Uber. You, you have to pay for your own, you know, gas and oil changes and tires. Um, same thing here. You're paying for your own marketing. You're paying for your trips. You're, they, they want you to go to conferences and conferences are, those are the tools of the business. You know, every business, if I, if I, you know, was a mechanic, I would have my toolbox and, and, and my set of tools that I used to fix the car, but those cost money. And so, uh, you're investing money into something that technically you don't own. You can't control it. Yeah. So I totally understand that, you know, you really get what you put in, but Late, so let's long term, let's say you have really built that platform and you're profiting, you're doing well. Can, you know, the people who are ahead of you, um, who actually own the company, take that away from you? Yeah. And is that something that happens once companies reach a certain point? I haven't, you know, really paid much attention. And so I'm not sure what happens when a company really tips that scale. But when it does, what happens? Well, I can tell you there's a probably, you know, only a handful of companies in that industry that have lasted more than, uh, you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, there mm-hmm. are thousands of direct sales companies. Uh, there's only a handful that, uh, you know, that, that stay in business. Uh, so when they promise, you know, generational income and things like that, you got to take it with a grain of salt because it's like anything else. I mean, uh, the company may not be around. Uh, it's certainly an industry that needs to self-regulate itself. It has not done a good job of that w- it, because of things that what you just described, uh, the real value in building a business, yes, they have clauses and there are w- the distributor agreements where they can, they have a lot of authority and power. And not only could the, their company go out of business, um, just like these others, you know, I mean, the Fortune 500 companies have gone out of business, you know, in the last 50 years. So, I, uh, but so yes, they, there's a good chance they're going to go out of business at some point. And then the mm-hmm. second thing is direct selling products have a lifespan. Uh, unless you're Amway, Mary Kay, Avon, even Avon struggled tremendously Back in 2011, 2012, 2013, started selling off their U.S. division. I mean, they really struggled. So, and and they're they're you know they were doing 11 billion dollars. Uh, I think about 11 billion dollars. So, and they were they were you know about struggling um, to to sell off or close certain certain divisions. So it doesn't matter how big they are, and the smaller ones are way more vulnerable. So they can be yes, okay. it can be taken from you, um, which means the value. You know, here's the value I think of a network marketing business. The work that you have to do to get to any level of success um, is a school that most people have never been to. Mm-hmm. Uh, so most people, you know, aren't great at communicating with other people. They're great at hanging out. They're great at drinking. They're great at the social partying. They, they're they not good at being able to interact with professionals. They're not good at, at owning who they are, their identity. They're not good at handling rejection. They're not good at being disciplined. They're not good um, at staying focused and keeping your eyes on the prize when it looks like you're going to lose bad. And okay. because that's what you, the life you live in when you're in the network marketing business, at least for an extended period of time, where you've got to do things with no results. It looks like very few results. And so you stay plugged in uh, long enough to start seeing some things. But most people quit. Most people quit within 90 days. And so, but, but if they stick in, it's really an education. I wouldn't view it as a business. I would view it as a great thing That's to a make a couple point. hundred bucks yeah. and grow. But the so people who get wrapped take- up into it, they drink the Kool-Aid. They think that, you know, they shut out the rest of their life. Nothing else exists. They're friends. They can't go out to dinner on a Friday night with you. They can't go see a movie. They can't, you know, uh, do, do some normal things. Then they, they, they're not missing the boat. They don't understand that the value they should be getting is they should be growing from, from, from the disciplines of that, not, not, uh, not drinking the Kool-Aid. The value of your business is not the check that, you're, that they're paying you each month. The value of your business is your relationships. That's the whole point of network marketing is networking. It is your, it, your, your network. So even though the company could take the business from me, if I built it right, if I had n- uh, an actual network that I built relationships as opposed to using people, uh, then I, I could go do whatever and they would follow me. So, yeah, that's really, thank you. That's good advice. And what I'm really taking away from this conversation is, you know, it's a really good opportunity to get kind of, you know, a business education and get profit off of that. But then, you know, you want to take that energy and 
that you've been putting a lot of lot into that business and then maybe put it into something that you can build on your own that you own something that you own yeah yeah something that you own something that you want man you've got your head on your shoulders i love uh i love the conversation i mean just to 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 question that and to see that and recognize that is huge so so kudos to you and hats off and and uh certainly hope to hope to hear uh, I know you're going to do great things, whatever you choose to do. <laughs> Thanks so much. Love your show. Love your hair. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Tommy, Bye. for calling Courageous Entrepreneur Radio. All right. Yeah, now, time now for my business hit list, hot list. Uh, I, you know, she liked my hair. Tom, I mean, I, I, she liked my hair. I just, I don't know what to say right now. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Hit, hot list, hit list. My hot list, first of all, Thomas Pink is back in the house. You have to understand, Thomas Pink is my favorite clothier in the world. Um, if you go to my Instagram account, at Roland, you will see uh, a, a, a picture with way too many Thomas Pink shirts lined up. And I, I, I love them. I love their brand. What I like about them is the subtlety of it. Like, I'll have on the cuff, on the inside of a cuff, it'll say pink and it's in pink thread or, uh, you know, uh, the shirt, the part that's tucked in a lot of times there's a little pink. They always put pink somewhere in it. Um, usually you can't see it. And, uh, I just love that because I know <laughs> it's not for anybody else. It's for me. I know. And it's amazing quality. If you look at most of the photos, uh, professional photos that are out on the internet of me, uh, most of them, I am in Thomas pink uh, suits and shirts and, you know, things like that. So, uh, anyway, glad to see they're back, but I've been, uh, hitting clothiers and retailers hard the last few months because, uh, uh, because they struggled just like everybody else. In fact, they had to close, they reopened on German street in London. It's a London based company. And, uh, you know, but they had, they had a couple of stores in the U S and that's how I obviously, uh, came to love them. And, but they have relaunched. I'm proud of them. Uh, they, they responded yesterday to me. And, and so my favorite cufflinks are Thomas pink. My favorite socks are Thomas pink. Uh, my favorite blazers suits, you know, and, and no, they're not a sponsor. They, I'm not getting paid to say this at all. They're not a sponsor. Uh, they should be, uh, but they are not sponsoring at this time. My hit list. All right. These guys, they are in for it. Number one, black Friday. Don't, don't lose it. First of all, happy Thanksgiving next week. Uh, I will not be doing the show on Thanksgiving. I will be speaking in Beijing on Thanksgiving uh, to China's Congress. So do, I, I, I will not be taking your calls. But uh, but Black Friday, uh, you know, unless you're trying to get a $30 TV, a $20 crock pot, you know, don't go Christmas shopping. That's not the day to go Christmas shopping. You're not getting the deals. You're not getting, you know, uh, Black Friday is so yesterday. It's antiquated. So uh, I want you to focus on, uh, you know, Cyber Monday or something instead. All right. You're listening to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio with Dr. Roland Roberts. I'll be right back with the business, uh, the boardroom battles. And I've got one more company on my hit list. All right. That was a fun segment. Wow. Wow. Great questions. I've got uh, one. Man, this is a. That was a phenomenal question, actually, because, you know, network marketing, I'm going to go a little bit deeper on that here during the commercial break. Network marketing, you know what the biggest problem is? You know, people think they are annoying. You know why network marketers are annoying? Because they don't care. They don't care. They don't care about you. They, they care about, you know, selling you something. They care about getting you on their team. They're not trying to get to know me. Now, if you try to get to know me, if you try to build a relationship with me, I may buy your products. I may join your team. But at least I'm not being sold. You genuinely care. You know what this boils down to is do you honor your prospects? Do you honor your prospects? And, you know, this doesn't just go for network marketers. I don't care who the, who the company is. If, uh, if I don't feel, if I feel like a number to them, I will do everything I can to not do business with them again. I'm not interested in just being a number. What's that? Two minutes. Uh, I'm not interested in just being a number. You know, uh, I want, I want a relationship. I want honor. Honor me because I'm doing business with you. Honor me. Honor your prospects 
in how you communicate with them. Honor them when you follow up with them. Honor. Honor goes a long way. And that's what that's what network marketers and direct sellers usually, uh, especially the more they drink the Kool-Aid, the further away they get from being grounded in reality. You're going to be out of that in a year or two. And you should be all in. You should be all in. What most network marketers haven't, in fact, the most successful ones have figured out how to be all in without abandoning everything else. In fact, if you do it right, uh, that's how you end up growing. Because what you're selling now, be careful what you're selling, what you attract them with is what you got to keep them with. And the next shiny object that comes along, the next weight loss product that comes along, the next you know, makeup deal that comes along or, or, you know, something from the Dead Sea or a remote jungle somewhere, they'll be on it uh, if you don't have, if you haven't built the relationship the way it should be. The value is in the network, not in the product. Welcome back to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio with Dr. Roland Roberts. I'm your host. I'm taking your calls live every Thursday at noon Eastern, 407-916-5400, 407-916-5400. I'm not taking any more calls today because I've got to get through the hot list, hit list, and the boardroom battles. Uh, you know, I was talking about Black Friday, but, you know, even if I was the CEO of a retailer right now, I would have to do a Black Friday sale because I have to do a Black Friday sale. But I would not be, you know, betting the bank on it. Uh, in fact, I'm on the board of directors for a, a nonprofit organization called Guys With Ties. We support a number of charities and a number of causes, and uh, we're going to be having a Black Friday special as well. So, uh, you know, I, I you, you got to do them. It's still a great thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, but just understand that uh, uh, that if you do it, be intentional about it. Don't be uh, don't just be haphazard or random about it. Uh, and if you want, if you're in Orlando and you want to go and support our organization, it's guyswithties.org. Uh, it's December 1st from 9 to 11 at Eve, Orlando. We are, uh, I'm chairing the event actually. I'll be in China, but I'm going to be doing a special video uh, from China, uh, which obviously uh, these charities that this party goes, uh, the funds from this party goes to uh, fights human trafficking. So it's rather ironic uh, what part of the world I'll be in. Uh, Jewel is the second company on my hit list. Juul is the e-cigarette manufacturer, the largest brand, the most popular brand. They have discontinued last week their fruity flavors, uh, and they just pulled all of their, they shut down all of their Facebook and Instagram accounts, uh, and they are doing everything they can to, to get ahead of things because they saw what happened with the massive tort lawsuits in the uh, the late nineties for the tobacco manufacturers. And so it's a, it's a disaster for them right now. They are trying to get ahead of that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I was actually pleased to see them shut down their Facebook and Instagram in a world where everybody thinks everything hinges on your Facebook page, which I, I, I almost dislike that I have to have a Facebook page. I wish I did not need to use social media. And uh, a lot of my audience is or more. Of my audience is now on Instagram uh, than they are on my on Facebook because Facebook page like you know I've got whatever how many thousands of people that follow but then it'll a uh, post will only show like to 100 people or 300 people and you've got thousands it just doesn't make any sense and so Facebook is kind of uh, you know missing the mark on that one and so I don't put any time effort attention or anything else into that particular page for that very reason uh, so uh, I think that's critical to understand. It's time now for the boardroom battles. I want to talk about, I got to interview two-time heavyweight boxing champion of the world, Pinklin Thomas, on Saturday. Also had the pleasure of interviewing the second employee for Universal. Now, that was fun. That was ironic. And uh, just getting to know him. And I'm not talking about, like, Universal Orlando. I'm talking about Universal Universal. Like, before there was a Universal Orlando. Like, the Universal in California. Uh, and before they had theme parks and everything else. And so, you know, just talking about the strategy and how did this morph and, you know, Universal is crushing it right now. Uh, they've, they've got a, a, another park coming up. They've got the, you know, Harry Potter world that, that is, it really blew up the islands of adventure and they got the train ride that connects the parks and, you know, they, they're able to charge extra for these things, but it's because of things that happened in books and movies. So they understand the long tail of marketing, the long tail of business, and they have created 
uh, this this fandom around these things. And, uh, you know, he was telling me about the day when their visionary CEO, uh, and, and I'm using that, you know, that word lightly whenever there's three of them in the room, you know, in a garage somewhere, and their visionary CEO says, uh, we really need to be in theme parks. They saw what Disney was doing, and uh, Disney World was not in existence there. It was just Disneyland. And, uh, you know, he's like, we really need to be in a theme parks. Well, we're in music or we're in this. What, what in the world? Why? Like, how, how are we going to get into theme parks? And, uh, and, and so sure enough, you see what's happened with Universal now. And of course, I uh, frequented, I went to Volcano Bay, their new water park uh, last year. I think last December uh, was when I was there last. And they're competing against SeaWorld's water parks. And, and then, of course, now they got this new water park. They're getting, getting more into the hotel. They just have the whole thing, just like Disney from the moment you land at, in, at the Orlando International Airport, they don't want you to, uh, they want to get you right on Disney property and they don't ever want you to leave. If you've got to, you know, buy a, to uh, a toothbrush, they want you to buy it from them. It's they want to keep every dime you spend here with them. And Universal, though, is getting, uh, they're, they're, they're being very strategic in how they're doing this. It's exactly the strategy that I was hoping SeaWorld would follow but uh, but they're doing it right. Also, I think it's ironic because Disney Spring Disney rebranded their downtown Disney to Disney Springs. You know, a few years ago, a lot of the locals couldn't stand that. Uh, a lot of people who frequented Disney di couldn't stand that. But uh, but but you know, they've totally overhauled it. It's a great place. It's certainly family friendly. They've tried to go kind of an adult theme after you know ten or eleven o'clock at night on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and uh, but City Walk, which is Universal's kind of equivalent to. Disney Springs is the adult version of that. There's some, you know, the world Ch the chocolate emporium is there. The hard rock cafe, a massive one is there. Um, I go there to listen to dueling pianos and they have the best. Uh, uh, let's see here. What is it? It, uh, it tastes like uh, the inside of a Cinnabon or something, you know, but it's bread pudding. That's what it is. We like some pecan ice cream or some vanilla ice cream with it. It's just amazing. We've got a really romantic like patio with some lights. And so I enjoy it over there, but, uh, but they attract a very different demographic. There's live music. Uh, as as well, but those are two different strategies, two different companies, and uh, just really enjoyed getting to talk with the uh, you know one of the visionary uh, founders there. But we're talking about retail, and I was praising Thomas Pink for coming back and how they have restructured their business. Uh, I want to talk about Men's Warehouse though, because that's the one that needs fixing right now. If I was on the board of of Men's Warehouse, first of all, George Zimmer, the guy who founded Men's Warehouse, uh, he sold the company. Uh, to a company called, a parent, the parent company is called Tailored Brands. And George, uh, he's the one you may recall on TV commercials who made famous the line, um, uh, you're going to like how you look, I guarantee it. <laughs> and I didn't use the same voice though, Tom. I, I, I didn't do that. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I like how you look. Can you do it? No, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're going to like how you look, I guarantee it. You know, he, had, he just had the voice for it. And, uh, but he's, he's very vocal uh, against what they are trying to do right now because tailored brands bought uh, Joss a banks for $1.8 billion. And it's been a disaster. Like this is what happens. So, so, you know, these executives get this bright idea. Okay. We bought men's warehouse. Now we're going to buy this other men's clothier and we're going to consolidate operations. Uh, we're going to consolidate operations. So uh, we'll save a bunch of money and, and, and we won't have to, um, you know, uh, and, and then we'll just get the profit and we own our competition. And I mean, just a lot of things. So it, it really makes a lot of sense on paper. It's kind of like owning a McDonald's and a Burger King. Whenever they get mad at you at McDonald's and you didn't make the burger right and fine, I'm taking my business elsewhere. I'm going across the street to Burger King. Ha ha. And, uh, and you own the Burger King. You're like, okay, see you later, you know, and you're getting the money no matter where they go. So I get the idea. I get the principle. Uh, but what I don't care for is that this came with massive debt. All right. And that massive debt that Jose Banks had is bringing down Men's Warehouse. It's bringing down. Now, forget what you think of the brand. Forget what you think about their approach and strategy and all those kind of things. The problem here is not any of those things, believe it or not. The problem is in the boardroom. The problem is the how the deals were financed. That's what's bringing it down, not strategy and, you know, all those things. Although I will say that uh, Men's Warehouse was gutsy. I mean, to, to uh, most uh, specific clothiers and retailers when they are target market specific, like plus size men, uh, women, um, teenagers, like forever 21 or, you know, things like that. Most of the time, those are not standalone stores. Those are, uh, stores that are in clusters, retail clusters, strip malls, malls, uh, because they rely so heavily on walk by traffic. 
If you have a standalone, what you're telling the world is that I am so important, I'm a destination. I'm a destination. People will get, leave their house, pull out of the garage, and they will come to my store because they need what I have so bad. And I, I mean, I'm not bashing, overly bashing. I guess I am a little bit, you know, men's warehouse clothing or Jossie Banks clothing. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to leave the house to go to Jossie Banks or to men's warehouse. Uh, so it was, that's what was incredibly gutsy is how they did that. And uh, with the standalone uh, store model. So uh, I personally think that if they lowered the rent, or, you know, they may have lower rent and lower sales by not being in a retail cluster, but I would rather pay some mall commissions and uh, have higher sales. Uh, it's very similar to the restaurant industry. It's too much of a hit or miss uh, because location is everything. It's like, you know, uh, with, with retail, just like, is it, just like it is with restaurants. Uh, you got to have, uh, you got to, you got to, you know, be very careful, the whole location, location, location. And you're probably not going to be good enough unless you've got a deep pockets to, to get it right nine times out of 10 all over the country, you know, unless you're Walmart or something like that, who, once again, you're a destination. You pull people, you pull businesses to you. So just some thoughts on, uh, on, on men's warehouse there and, uh, and what's happening with Joss A. Banks. I hope that you will join me on my next all-inclusive three-day, two-night faith-based CEO cruise. It's February 15th through the 17th. It's $199 per person for, I think, one more week, and then it goes to $299 per person, and that includes everything, including gratuities. Right now, we lose money uh, if you purchase, and, uh, and, and, and so that goes up at, to $299 uh, here shortly. Uh, but it's a great time. It's access. Uh, it's relationships. Uh, you know, you're, 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 it's not suits and ties and conferences. It is getting to know each other and really talk through strategy and people invest in people. They don't invest in ideas. They don't invest in products. They don't invest in services. They invest in you, which is why I want, and I encourage so many entrepreneurs to work on themselves and entrepreneurship itself is a front row seat to a school that you, you love to hate. Uh, but it sure makes you into an incredible person. So make sure that you uh, join us there. We probably, uh, my friend, the inventor of the McDonald's happy meal will be on board Get a chance to meet him. It's always fun to take a picture. And uh, you know, tell your kids and grandkids about it. It's, uh, it's a good time. And uh, also, if you're interested in sponsorships, uh, you can check us out at CourageousGlobal.com. That's the different events uh, that I'm going to be at in China, in Beijing, in Shanghai, in Tiananmen Square. Also, uh, whenever I put 30,000 people in the stadium in Nairobi, Kenya on May 10th, um, I've got Paula Dunn, who's an incredible... A vocalist. You can see some of the things I've promoted uh, about her on my social media. I think Facebook specifically. Make sure that you uh, check her out. She's an incredible entertainer. She's going to be headlining that event with us. So we've got a lot of things coming up that you don't want to miss. Uh, we'll have a second stadium event in a different country. Uh, we're actually simulcasting the Nairobi event to six other countries. And so uh, we expect to have a large audience really excited about that. Uh, the one that we expect to ho host in November uh, we plan on having 100,000 people in that stadium. So if you want to be a part of what we're doing in any way, if you want to reach the market, you know, a million people a week um, through the outlets and the channels that we have, then feel free to reach out. We'll get your brand logo. I'm thankful for my sponsors. I'm thankful for for, for uh, 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 New York Life and uh, Nick McCarthy, who is the advisor, which you can go to CourageousRadio.com and see, win experiences. Uh, you can check them out. And, uh, and then also Tom Coast Tavern. I'll be there tonight at 6 p 6.30 p.m. If you want to stop by, say hello, get a picture. We'll have a great time. I'll be taking your calls, growing your businesses, and creating breakthroughs again next Thursday, actually in a couple weeks at noon Eastern time. So thank you again to my sponsors. You've been listening to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio. I'm Dr. Roland Roberts, encouraging you to live your faith in business. You've been listening to Courageous Entrepreneur Radio with America's CEO, Dr. Roland Roberts. We pour time-tested business principles into hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs every week. And we could not do it without your sacrificial giving. If you want to engage Dr. Roberts to speak or work with your organization, connect with us at CourageousRadio.com or at Courageous Media on Facebook. Join us next week as Dr. Roland Roberts shapes the lives and businesses of entrepreneurs the world over. All right. Great show. Great show. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, love the questions, love the comments, love the interaction. 
And um, so I'll be out next week. I may be able to do some semblance of a live stream, but uh, you know, there's a lot of websites that are banned in China, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Google, everything Google. <laughs> uh, you know, you. Uh, so it's just an interesting uh, time. I'll be there for about three weeks, and uh, so 26 hour flight there. Uh, and, and, and back. So uh, I'll be spending 21 plus hours on a single flight. Uh, it's not, not a short thing. And, uh, but I, I'll have Wi-Fi, And so I'll be able to stay connected. But if you have any questions, send them. I, so one of the questions uh, I got this week was through Instagram. So feel free to reach out on, uh, on any of our platforms with a question and uh, they'll get them to me and I'll take them if I don't have callers. And so uh, I love serving and I love the questions today. So uh, my hat's off to the entrepreneurs that called in and uh, some great questions, man, sharp people. I, I love the people who call in. I love the people who listen to this show uh, from all over the world. And so really glad that you're a part of it. Uh, I'll try to send some love from uh, from Beijing and, and, and maybe we will we'll air a clip or two uh, of my speech in Tiananmen Square. Until then, Hope you live your faith in business and make a difference.